Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's lecture on behalf of the students and the faculty of SIRE. We're pleased to welcome back to Los Angeles tonight's speaker, Jorge Silvetti. Professionally, Jorge Silvetti and the collaboration of Machado and Silvetti have won numerous awards for their work in architecture, urban design, furniture design, and most recently, a project which some of you may have seen for an interior, the Portatina Boutique in New York City. Their work has been published extensively both here and abroad. As a teacher, Professor Silvetti has been teaching at Harvard University and in Italy. The list of universities that he has taught at and lectured at are numerous. In addition, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his writings um, as he's written extensively on architectural theory. Most recently, he's returned from Rome where he was a recipient of the Rome Prize and a fellow at the American Academy. Um, he will be speaking tonight on some of the research conducted there. Tonight's talk is entitled Architectural Space. Let's call things by their rightful name. The lecture will be followed by a reception in the annex where Professor Silvetti will answer questions. Professor Silvetti. my text now. Um, um, I need one minute here. <laughs> I came, this is my second time, I was here three years ago, almost to the date, and I said I had to remember that the podium ends before the screen because I almost died, but I didn't remember this. <laughs> So, I'll have to come a third time to do it well. Um, anyway, <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you what, I, what I'm planning to do tonight, because it's a, it's a, a strange type of lecture for me. Um, I was fascinated by the subject of the lectures, of the series. I was honor to be included uh, among some of the uh, uh, participants that I regard and respect uh, very highly. Um, and uh, at the same time, I found the subject matter very uh, difficult. I must correct um, Gary's presentation because I was not working on this lecture in Rome. I've been working in this lecture not for too long, in fact. <laughs> And uh, um, I will address that issue from the perspective of an architect, a practitioner, a designer. Um, and uh, that will probably take, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. Uh, and then drastically I will move into discussion of one of my projects that I think will be very relevant for the discussion uh, of, for the subject of the lecture series. Um, it is uh, going to be drastic in the sense that I will, not to try, I will try not to make a, a direct correlation between the two. In fact, one of the problems I found with the discuss discussion about space is that very attempt to correlate different kinds of discourses. Um, changing concepts of space in architecture and in art. I don't have one to propose for you tonight, a changing concept. I must confess that at the beginning. And I have doubts that there is one. So I will not talk about new concepts of space in architecture. I will talk about how we talk about them, because I think that is a key issue to understand some of our predicaments today. We speak, we draw, and we write about space. And uh, we do this uh, as we do about a lot of things. To talk about new concepts of space is always 
I find as I begin to read and prepare for this lecture is always to talk about drawings, to talk about paintings, to talk about writings, which is in the mm -hmm. end to talk, to reflect on systems of representation of space. Rarely we talk about space itself. In doing this, in talking about representations of space, about drawings, about paintings, about writings, in part, important boundaries are blurred, sometimes forgotten. And so the discourses on space, most of the time, are based on metaphors, metaphors that are forgotten and where we tend to substitute one language with another. Um, in talking about space, uh, space we, always substitute, we always talk then about things that I already just mentioned in this very short introduction. We talked about the substitution, we talk about substances, we talk about boundaries, we talk about representation. If we look at the history at, of the theory of a space in art and in architecture, those issues seems to be always interrelated. And I found that the best way to start for not a scholar, uh, but somebody interested in theory, is like with so many things, go back to the early foundations of modernity in the Enlightenment and probably look at Lessing and his work on, um, it's called the Laocon, uh, where he inaugurates, in a way, the modern polemic about boundaries and about the discourse, a certain particular discourse about space. He discusses in this book uh, the old proposition of painting, uh, of poetry is like painting, uh, and of course takes sides, but bases his argument, a very meticulous argument, very well presented, very rational, very wrong today in many ways. Um, in terms of the medium, what is the medium of poetry, what is the medium is pa of painting, and it is in that sense that inaugurates, I think, a discourse that is still very contemporary, or at least we are concerned with. And he then talks about space, classifies those arts that he puts on the side of painting, which architecture, sculpture, and all of those go, which are concerned with what he says, bodies in action. Um, and to that goes the substance, the medium of space. And time is about the actions of bodies. And that relates then to the discourse of poetry, of literature. Um, that somehow dominated a sort of a notion of how to conceptualize space and how to assign it mostly then to the uh, visual arts. Um, and it till is carried through the epoch, the, the times of modernism and the avant-garde art. However, today, if there is something that we can now seriously uh, declare to be a, a particularity of postmodernism is particularly that that the boundary among the arts uh, are blurred and a little bit more confused, if not confused at all. And in our particular field, we are always struggling between issues of art in general and the relationships, if at all, overlappings or confusions between what is a sculpture, what is landscape architecture, what is architecture. The medium, the substance, the nature of the practice the space, uh, as it characterizes these practices, seems to be not so relevant at all these days. And I have to refer to you, and most of you, I'm sure, know the, to me, seminal article by Rosalind Krauss, Sculpture on the Expanded Field, which by the day, since it appeared many, many years ago in October, is becoming a source of uh, ideas and of orientation in trying to discern, at least to me, but I think to many people, uh, this uh, contemporary, conf seemingly confusing condition. And I'm going to quote from her, I'm going to quote from other things tonight. Um, 
and she's talking about artists and the problem of all this blurring of boundaries. And I quote, this suspicion of a career that moves continually and erratically beyond the domain of sculpture obviously derives from the modernist demand for the purity and separateness of the various mediums, and thus the necessi necessary specialization of a practitioner within a given medium. But what appears as eclectic from one point of view can be seen as rigorously logical from another. For within the situation of postmodernism, practice is not defined in relation to a given medium, sculpture in, in the case she's talking about, but rather in relation to the logical operations on a set of cultural terms for which any medium photography, books, lines on walls, mirrors, or sculpture itself might be used. I find that uh, paragraph uh, rather uh, enlightening. Uh, architecture then, and I endorse in a way this view, can be one medium for those logical operations uh, on uh, on a set of cultural terms, as you said. And I agree with that. But then I think some things follow from here. If architecture can be the content of art at a specific times, at opportune times, and not artistic ideas be the content of architecture, because I think that's what she's saying there, if at the same time some of you, like me, still insist on being architects all the time, not only on those times when it's opportune to be an artist. It seems that we can focus on the problem of architecture and space independently from artistic considerations, which is easier said than done. I propose to approach issues of medium, of boundaries, of representations, etc., because I do think they finally all converge into this problem of space. Uh, um, space um, by stopping, if you want, by suspending, you know, a sort of a general picture of, of, of architecture, stopping for a minute at the moment of creativity and see what we actually, as architects, do. And then how it is that what we do exists independently of us. That's a question that any artist obviously could, should ask of his work and then how it is experienced. And we then have another picture, very different than that of mediums that Lessing was presented, presenting, and something that is not unfamiliar to any of us. Because we can cut, you know, the, this now continuum, apparently, of art into um, different kinds of uh, conditions under which they are, they are the, work is created. The painter and the sculpture, in a conventional sense, of course, create the very thing that is the work of art. The artist work on the object, and the object is immediate, and as such, it, is, it goes to the public. On another end, one could think about the playwright or the musician which work on a thing itself, but which is not exactly the thing itself, which requires an intermediate step of the performance, which includes an interpretation in order to arrive to the other side. It is mediated then by a certain moment. This moment of creativity is working with something not entirely the thing itself. Architecture, I think, is an extreme case in this, uh, from this perspective. Because we do work, actually work, with a total substitute, a simile, uh, in another medium of the thing that is to be. We work with the representation, what is to exist, what is to come, is totally mediated. And besides then this substitution, in the moment of creativity by another medium of what we intend to do, Besides that, the object itself in space and time is deferred. So we have substitution and deferral as two ingredients 
that indeed complicate uh, the matter of the moment of creativity in architecture. In one piece of writing that I wrote long ago, I said something that um, was a little bit scandalous at that time, because I said, architects do not build buildings, architects draw. That's all we do. <laughs> and um, the implication of this simple fact being that creativity in architecture occurs only at the moment of representation, at this sort of uh, moment of substitution and deferral. I am very preoccupied about this deferral because I think it's the source of an extraordinary complex process and phenomena, and that is the cause of many confusions and legacies uh, that we have from the avant-garde. To me, to understand this deferral is to understand architectural richness, its difficulties, to clear some of the problems I think that we are facing today and help to dispel some confusions about boundaries and mostly to destroy one of the myths which is that of a space as we have been talking about for a long time. I would say that criticism should indeed tackle this issue of the deferral uh, in the moment of creativity with urgency if we are, with, if we are to establish clear relationships with the two institutions that I think we are in more trouble today. One, the, institution, the institutions of power, because it is always a problem of representation. And the other, the institution of art, of which we always want to play with, but I think now we are in, 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 in pretty bad uh, shape in our relationships. My lecture um, has that side title then, let's call things by their rightful names because I think we can talk um, about architecture and about space, uh, not necessarily in the way we've been talking, but in a way that indeed reflect a little bit more closely the way things are. Interestingly enough, I can go back to Rosalind Krauss's article when she starts discussing this problem of a sculpture that nobody recognizes what sculpture is anymore, and yet everybody talks about sculpture, um, and so she says, we stare at the pit in the earth and we, think, and we think we both do and don't know what sculpture is. Yet, she said, I would submit that we know very well what sculpture is. And I would submit exactly the same thing in terms of what architecture is and does. Let me then reiterate what I've been saying many times lately in writing that architecture happens to things external to the mind. In artifacts that we call, more often than not, buildings, which are the result of a decision to make them, and to make them do some things defined a priori, irrespective of whatever new things, purpose, or discoveries one might find in the process of making them, or in experiencing them. So, that is what I would use as a very rough sketch of what I think the substance of architecture is, the uh, uh, medium that we are working with and on which I will uh, reflect about the issue of space. <clears throat> and yet, as uh, one thing we have to establish, not to sound uh, too uh, retrograde in this presentation, <laughs> is that uh, the, uh, while sculpture can say, well, we are, what we think we mean by a sculpture is something that was historically bounded and had a kind of uh, period in which it was true, but it's not true anymore. Uh, the institution of architecture, I think, ha is like, it's not necessarily uh, the same case, although some conceptions of architecture obviously are historical bounded. The fact that architecture, if we understand it in that line or from that perspective of buildings, 
that architecture is involved with the social discourses of use in its widest sense, make it not a choice. From an architectural perspective, then, I recognize simply two types of conditions that generate two different, truly different types of a space. We should have the first two slides. And I'm not going to say things that are too uh, difficult to understand because you know these things very well. The other one? Okay. Um, and I go back to very basics, to the idea of the bearing wall and the column, which to me, uh, the passage from one to the other uh, represent the major and substantial and fundamental change in the nature of architectural space in the history of architecture. And I don't need really to comment much on these two slides, on these uh, sets of slides, because uh, you know where they're coming from and you know what they are expressing, uh, the different types of spaces. And this I'm saying I'm talking from an architectural point of view, which is, I suppose, the way we should be talking. Uh, because once we uh, move a little bit aside from this pure description of the conditions that allow the creation of a space, in this case there are static conditions, construction conditions and material conditions, of course we enter into those other discourses that we like more than these, which are all the metaphors in which we begin to talk about the different nuances, the different types of spaces, of continuities, hierarchies, uh, of spaces that are uh, more dogmatic, uh, spaces that are more accommodating, uh, <coughs> spaces that are perspectival, spaces that have narrative, all of these four cases obviously relating to the idea of the bearing wall, or spaces that are static or dynamic or free or organic. Of course, all of these are disqualifications that we need to express the differences between these spaces. And uh, they are all uh, things, as I said, we like to do, but we tend to forget. And I have had discussions about whether, with, with a very respectable historian, about whether the free plan of Corbu was free at all, or not free. I mean, and what we were talking about? I mean, it's just a space. I mean, it's not that doesn't make anybody free or, or less free. Uh, it's just the way it is, and one can talk, uses those things to express a certain condition uh, of materiality and allow to do some things that in relation to other things, one could choose the metaphor of freedom. But what I'm trying to point out is we resolved all the discussion about space at another level, in another language, with other discourses. And, of course, we have that uh, epitome of uh, representation of space uh, that I would like to call also a metaphor, but which presents us a very, very different uh, problem, which is perspective and perspectival uh, space. Because we could certainly qualify these two very different conceptions of the space represented with perspectival methods. The one on the right, one of the stage that's by Ser Leo, this a perspective by Viviana. One unmistakably representing the space of humanism, the one point perspective. The other, the space of the Baroque, the space sliding out of the frame, uh, opening uh, the long distance and not really converging anywhere, but rather uh, escaping. And that more modern uh, type of perspectival representation chosen at a certain time to represent, again metaphorically, a certain sense or a certain uh, vision of uh, society. But this perspectival space, and I'm gonna back to the more canonic uh, types of uh, perspective, um, can we just dismiss it entirely as a metaphor for uh, uh, space? I think we do have a problem here because 
history never repeats itself and it's never even and there are moments where some things happen and only happen once and never again and I think that is the case in a way with perspective because they are, it is very hard to disentangle the system of representation with the space itself, with the idea of the space itself and with the ideology and the metaphors that support it. We know that as a system of representation, as a system of representation charged with symbolic value, it is historically bound and finito in that sense. From an artistic point of view, then, we see this as a historical, we can historicize and say where it belongs. However, it is very hard for me and for many, I think, that understand the other ramifications of perspective to dismiss it as a technical um, uh, device, uh, to dismiss it from a technical point of view uh, in the actual uh, process of researching and investigating and producing architecture. So we have in the case of perspective, and I'm stopping here because I think any discussion about space in architecture cannot, and about representation of space cannot avoid a certain stance with respect to perspective. So we have here a technical issue, and we have a symbolic artistic issue, if you want. And we also have the belief, I think that's something we I believe we all share today that, and that's where we are talking about this, <laughs> that the medium that we use influences the work. That is to say that it has a certain uh, bearing on what the work in the end turns out uh, to be. And uh, I have written about that more extensively about the issue of perspective, and I would like to read for you a long paragraph because I think uh, that explains to you how I see the problem of representation of space, that of particularly the role of perspective, and then begins to outline the confusion that I think that has uh, happened after the demise of perspective as an artistic um, um, as an artistic uh, sort of symbolic system. So I'm reading, if we have come to accept the notion that the means of productions and the techniques of productions influence the product, and if we also know through history that in the field of the visual arts, and in particular in architecture, all the intervening elements may, might acquire symbolic value irrespective of their original or functional role, and that particularly technological or scientific discoveries have been favorite vehicles for symbolic representation, then we might also be willing to accept the fact that such a process of symbolization may become obsolete, irrelevant, and reverse itself or become inactive, leaving thus those elements free from symbolic and rhetorical tasks, and able to return unencumbered to perform their original functional roles, which in all likelihood might still be required. This active, dynamic, and unstable relationship between technique and symbol seems particularly clear in the case of perspective, which by now, and for a long time, has ceased to carry any of its origi original symbolic meaning. Certainly a lot has happened since the days of Brunelleschi to our culture, to our society, to our understanding and conceptualization of space, and to art for us to pretend that perspective, representation still stands for the tenets of humanism. And yet, unlike painting, where the issue of representation of a space was the issue, and a reiteration of illusionistic, Renaissance-like perspective may not add anything to its history and evolution. In architecture, the representation of a space is a means to an end and not its substance. And the discovery of perspective, irrespective of the ideological connotations that it acquired at the time of its inception, formalized a technique of representation that has become indispensable ever since. 
For one must ask the obvious, but somehow repressed question, what is wrong with representing the object, the space, as it, is actu as it actually seems to appear to the viewer when it is inscribed in his cone of vision? Which generates other not so obvious questions, such as, is that a restricted technical device or may it rather complement others? May symbolism find another place in the rich output of architecture, perhaps in the building as experienced by the beholder rather than its representation? Our art may have changed, its boundaries contracted or expanded over the centuries and our concerns shifted one way or another, but we are still among many other constants dealing with visual material of a three-dimensional nature and hence with spatial phenomena that is to be seen. And because of that, and because the project comes before the object exists, the anticipated tests of its visual and spatial performances has become part of the process of design. In that moment, perspective still plays an irreplaceable role. The paradox is that in the current attempts to deconstruct or decompose our culture and its products, of which perspective representation is an easy target, and in the parallel and determined struggle to find at all costs a symbolic form for our times and architecture, some critics fall into an even more profound cultural trap of Renaissance envy when unconsciously they long to replicate the overall cultural format of the Renaissance, a very unique format where an ideology, a conception of a space, an architectural language, a newly defined practice architecture, and a political structure all coincided and found their best, happiest, and synthetic symbol in the newly discovered technique of illusionistic representation of three-dimensional space in two dimensions. It is this particular startling and unique condition of convergence of all those factors on a technique of accurate representation that correspond to the scientific understanding of the laws of optics, which in spite of its imperfections is still today the simplest and most accurate way of represent space figuratively, and which depicts reality photographically in a way that we must understand is profoundly unique and peculiar to the Renaissance and may not be repeated again. These understandings will leave then perspective as such, as a privileged technique of representation of a space that was discovered once, that still serves successfully to investigate some important spatial conditions in the process of design, although it may have no relevance anymore for the artistic and symbolic representation of a space. I think modern architects have no problems in showing that dual uh, condition. Here we have Hilbertheimer using both, one certainly to convey the symbolic, other to convey uh, the more uh, illusionistic one. And uh, Elitsky, and let's leave this here on Corbuhu, uh, shifts from one to the other uh, with no problem uh, whatsoever. <clears throat> My contention is that once painting abandons rightly its interest in representing space figuratively or its interest in space at all, architecture lost what had been until that point a very important tool of legitimization to cli claim an artistic status. Architecture was left with a technique that, a technique that artistically had no value was perspective, but that technically had a lot and still has. Which is not to say, and that's where the confusion sort of gets reinforced, that architecture lost its artistic capacity. It is that it lost a kind of parallelism and conversion and coincidence with the practice of painting. And this is so because the architectural drawing cannot escape a reality, and I'm saying things that are very simple, but I think one needs to say, that, to say them, is that the architectural drawing is always figurative. It always has to represent something that then has to be done, so it has to it establish a one-to-one -one correspondence with that if the object uh, is going to exist at all. 
Architectural research must use drawing. Painterly uh, research, I mean, uh, figurative drawing. And of course, research in painting does not need that. Which is, I think, the source of great confusion, of great mistakes uh, at the very origin of modernity. To make a long story short, I'm going to just jump uh, to this, which is precisely, because I think it's a very uh, intelligent uh, proposition, uh, this is the Ohio uh, Visual Center of Peter Eisenman, and let me leave the other, oh, excuse me, I have to go back, oh. okay, and no. That one doesn't work. The one on the right? If you could move one more. Um, which is, to me, synthesized in a way, no, forward. Um, um, this problem of uh, the uh, nature of the drawing and uh, its existence uh, and uh, what it is, uh, how, how it is used. The idea of the rotating uh, grids, for instance, which is definitively, in my view, well, what, first one of the diseases of, of our times, but, uh, <laughs> but also it's a direct result of the confusion of the two dimensions uh, of the white paper that we have in front of us and the three-dimensional reality of the buildings. Uh, it is graphic, it is painterly, it is two-dimensional, uh, and then it is turned into all those metaphors that we listen uh, in reviews, in, in criticism, uh, as representing this, uh, the openness of the campus to the greed of the community so people can come in and all that. The relationship with the stadium, there is even another one which relates to the uh, um, airfield like uh, two miles away. Um, and, uh, and I think one, I, I know this is a very, uh, uh, not only popular, but very much believed way of generating uh, architecture. I don't want to judge it, we haven't seen it, it's under construction, and I'm glad, because I'm going to go and look at it, I might be absolutely wrong, but I have my doubts that this is the way of generating uh, architecture space. And I'm pointing this, and this is the only example, I'm, because I'm going to finish very soon, hopefully, with this introduction, um, is what to me uh, is, is a representation then of this uh, mistake that happens at that moment when, when one loses contact that kind of convergence with uh, representation in painting, but one gets continuously fascinated by the work of painters and continues to do and replicate their same research in architecture. A confusion rooted in that unique condition, I think, of deferral and substitution. So I should correct now myself when I said so categorically many years ago that architects do not build buildings, that architects draw. I should say that architects, real architects, <laughs> seem to draw. <laughs> but they, what they actually are doing is they are seeing the building through those drawings. Um, and my last quote, again from myself, um, when I said about what I thought of my own drawings, I continue to see through the paper and into the imagination which is to say that the drawings that I do are two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional things that want to exist that are concerned with space and its occupancy, with materials, with dimensions, with the human body, with gravity, and with the fact that they will be seen by the eyes of many moving about them in particular uh, locations. I think we should accept these conditions and sever if necessary, the ties with paint and sculpture with no shame is they are of no purpose to the production of architecture uh, as, in a way, I see it. I mean, that's what I think we should do. Serve 
um, we should uh, accept these conditions that sh should serve as vehicles for, uh, we should serve the architecture as vehicle for art when the opportunity is correct and appropriate in the terms I would say that Rosalind Krauss defined so well and regenerate our own issues and problems. Paradoxically, I think by calling things by their rightful names, the space we've been so concerned to find and to define, to make coincide with the zeitgeist and all those things, might just evaporate immediately, dissipate, and the real concrete, tangible space of architecture reemerge re without mystifications. It is with this understanding, then, with this ever clearer for us understanding of uh, what architecture should be concerned with uh, of the moment and uh, what it is that we are actually doing and what are our tools and what the moment of creativity consists of and for what purposes that I think all of our productivity, all of our projects uh, should be uh, seen. We've been in a way closing in throughout all our projects more and more on this concreteness and discovering in a way uh, this space we need, which is not uh, so mysterious. Which is not to say that uh, we renounce to metaphor, to symbolism. I think if you know our work, you know we don't. <laughs> but that we try to place it correctly in its proper rightful place. What I will do now is to shift to this project, which I chose, although it's not my most recent project, because I think is the one that uh, reflects uh, uh, in, in its richness, I find it a very rich project, uh, most of these uh, concerns, of these understandings of what architecture is, and where there is a use of drawing and of a, a conception of a space, I think, that will illustrate, uh, without really necessarily I will make a, a connection, but illustrate what I've been saying. This is the project of the plazas and the tower for uh, Sicily that was very poorly published and I don't think uh, most of you have really uh, seen well. Um, and uh, the other reason is that, uh, and this is a little bit of advertisement for my firm, that my partner uh, is lecturing at UCLA uh, in December showing our latest work, uh, among which there is an entry for um, Pershing Square that you should be interested in seeing. But anyway, that one, that, uh, okay. Um, we should move them together, okay? Um, and um, this is a work concerned with a lot of things, um, with history, place, uh, location, uh, public space, but I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, it's uh, a commission I got four, three years ago. Uh, in Sicily, in the very center of Sicily, uh, you see that city Enna, and right up the city, it's small town of Leonforte, which is where the commission is. Um, at that time, uh, what they uh, required was, uh, it was the work uh, to provide uh, design in very vague terms for four uh, squares in the town. Let me tell you a little bit about the site and its uh, uh, conditions. What you uh, see here is the landscape uh, characteristic landscape of the area around the town of Leonforte. This is the center of Sicily, very different than the coastal areas, which is where most tourists uh, know. And what we're seeing are these, uh, on the right, two cities, Enna, the major one on the left, and again here on the left in the larger picture, and Calasciveta, the other one across. The picture on the right, seen from the town of Leonforte where these projects are. Uh, it's a very, very fertile, very rich agricultural area now. Um, and uh, they produce mostly uh, fruits, oranges, uh, citrus, and peaches. So uh, the local uh, vernacular and the oranges. Um, a very, no, oh. Now that one moves. Okay, okay. Let me go back to these. All right. Um, 
a very uh, important town founded in the 17th century, early 17th century, uh, very rich at the time because uh, it had a lot of water. It had three uh, uh, sources of water, and so it has a lot of uh, windmills, I mean uh, mills uh, for, for different kinds of industries. And uh, the town itself, as it sort of hangs, can we focus that? Can I do that myself? Uh, I get them confused. Okay. Um, the town on the, uh, as we see the, on the left, it sort of hangs over its own uh, productive uh, valley. It sort of looks at it. Uh, and you see that on the right. Um, a little bit of history. The city was founded in 1610. It was a, a new city, a new town. Nothing existed there before. Uh, and the first uh, uh, sort of settlement at, at the foundation time is this, which is the people that began to work on the land and to build the city itself. Uh, very poor, but still existing. The fabric, mostly abandoned, really uh, hanging over the valley. You can see that the topography is also interesting. The city will grow along the flat area of the center. On the right, you see the plan of the Baroque uh, city as it was built with um, a major axis, and we can look at uh, the other photographs. But anyway, there is uh, a, a gate on the right that goes to Catania, and that's the axis. Um, that one is not working on the right again. Can we move the one on the, on the right? Yeah. Um, it is a very um, interesting town, very poor now, but it uh, preserves a very clear uh, idea of uh, planning reflected, reflecting very much uh, certain uh, humanistic ideas and conceptions. Uh, uh, it is designed with precise uh, proportional systems of a golden section. And uh, it uh, corresponds to this kind of uh, anthropomorphic abstraction of, of head uh, with the castle and the church on the, on the left hand side. Uh, the uh, center, which it corresponds to the novel and the stomach, I suppose, is the market, um, produce market, used to be. And at the bottom is the gate uh, to Catania. Um, the designer is not known, um, but it cannot have been done without uh, a design because of the precise dimensions and the precision of the location. Um, it is probably that the prince himself uh, was the author, as he was a very cultivated uh, man. We should move the one on the right. Um, we see the pictures now of some of the most important and representative elements of the town. Uh, on the right, you see the plans of the castle itself and the um, cathedral, and the small piazza in front of the cathedral and the long piazza in front of the castle. Very atypical, for those that do not know Sicily, the location of those two elements in relation to the piazzas, but one finds a lot of precedence in Sicily itself of these piazzas not necessarily on the center of the main axis, but to the sides and the buildings not facing each other. You see a view now of the palace and the castle on the uh, left, of the church and the castle. Details, the cathedral and the palace. The palace is in total state of disrepair. And the long piazza of the stables, the palazzo on the left, and the stables at the end, they, that building that you see on the right without a roof, but with very uh, important uh, facade for this uh, town. A very long plaza with a very important perspectival effect. Uh, here we see the facade crumbling of that um, particular place where the stables used to be. This was a very famous town for its horses. It's written 
in many texts and, and reported by very many travelers in the chronicles. And these were the stables where one finds today, you know, they dispose of their cars. So it still more or less maintains a certain uh, 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 persistence of, of uh, infrastructural function or whatever. Um, very uh, noble uh, facade. Uh, shows a little bit of the ambition and the richness of a certain moment. It also shows the incredible state of disrepair of the place today. And that is the founding princip uh, Prince Bast. Um, the Market Plaza, probably the most interesting art, uh, urbanistically because it's the most determining and willful uh, piece, uh, around Piazza very much uh, destroying the, in its facade because of additions. It used to be two stories and there are some redmans. Um, and uh, it is a perfect circle that has been sort of exploded by the streets. And uh, it uh, occupies, it sort of is a demonstration of the, of the design will of these people because it falls in the worst place possible, but that falls there because of golden section uh, demand, so they build it there. Uh, and they build it there uh, with the image, not unlike uh, any the things that were happening at that time, of, of imitation and emulation of the most important city uh, uh, from which this one depended, which was Palermo, uh, which precisely is structured around a crossing of access and around plaza. Uh, and they, that's not really a remnant of Roman uh, Cardus and the Cumanos, but rather Spanish intervention of the 15th, 16th century as those two streets are cut uh, in, the, in the old Arab city of Palermo. Um, in, uh, here, uh, I'm saying it falls in the worst part of the town because, uh, as you can see, the transversal axis exists, but it cannot be really transversed very easily. Uh, there are two stairs on each side, uh, and uh, uh, this is what the effect they were trying to get from Palermo, but, uh, and of course they get it on one direction, the, the city is still very small, but the urban effect, very precise, very clear, very baroque. In the other direction, of course, that's impossible, but they manage uh, to deal with uh, still other kind of uh, elements, um, which is interesting to point out because that's, uh, uh, a contextual issue, if you want, that one wouldn't really make too much of it. But I'm saying the kind of, uh, of no shame <laughs> in doing things like that that one founds all over Sicily, a kind of excess uh, or sort of making virtue of the most uh, difficult conditions, and particularly the kind of excess with stairs. Um, finally, the most important uh, to me uh, element in this whole uh, humanistic sort of representation of the city, which is uh, a monument that appears at the bottom. You see that with the letter A on the left-hand side of the plan over there, and which you see now frontally, which is a fountain uh, that sort of hangs over a, a very uh, pronounced uh, slope, and uh, which is a fountain that is unlike any other fountain because it is a very strange fountain. It does a lot of things, uh, and it has a very particular uh, uh, form and a very, very unique iconographic program, very hard to decipher. What you see behind it is the road to Palermo, the old road, not the one one uses today, um, that ends exactly at the right of the fountain, which begins to tell you also that the fountain was not only a fountain, but in a way a gate and a receiving, or, and, and a city wall. Uh, you see more clearly what I'm talking about when I said it's not your common fountain. Um, it's uh, very long and very flat. Um, it has 24 spouts of water running constantly, been running since the time of its uh, um, building. And uh, it is a fountain that serves then as a place to get water. It's a trough for beasts. It is also a wall, a city wall. It is a receiving element as one enters on the right of it through the gate from Palermo. And it is also uh, a monument, the most memorable um, element in the city. But what it does, in addition to its pretty huge, 
um, is that the most interesting thing? It is that it, it is an optical device, an optical machinery uh, that controls the views of the territory, the agricultural land on which this city depends. And by controlling it and by bringing it back to you, it sort of establishes a very, very unique and strong relationship uh, between the two. It makes them, in a way, closer. It makes them even more present rather than a natural condition. It sort of uh, 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 brings it to you by cutting it out uh, in a very particular way, in a very strong way. These things indeed impress me uh, very much. Uh, and other, until up to this day, I'm, I'm in a way fascinated, uh, very much attracted by this, this, this artifact, this machine that is so uh, odd so strange, so excessive, uh, and so complex, and that does so many things, and all of them so well, and uh, it, is, it is almost like an, like an apparition in the middle uh, of the landscape. And it is part of the landscape, it's part of the city. These are the doors, uh, that's the gate to Palermo just next to the fountain. And on the right, the entrance to yet another surprise, which is that at the times of the prince in the 17th century, uh, right below it, there was one of the first botanical gardens uh, known, uh, also reported in many books and chroniclers of the time. Uh, the garden, as a botanical garden, has disappeared, but it's interesting to notice the continuity uh, of these type of functions, as today a vegetable garden still is there, probably the greenest part uh, of the whole town is privately owned, but we found uh, under it, still the remnants of that garden with fountains uh, and uh, nymphaeums and things like that. It is to this uh, rather strange to me, but fascinating place, uh, really and truly remote, uh, even from, from, from what we know more about Sicily. I mean, to arrive here is, is, is not, uh, easy, not, not necessarily in terms of transportation, but through the different accommodations one has to make in one's mind. Uh, it is to this uh, kind of uh, city and what happened to it after that uh, I was called, we were called to uh, intervene. What you see on the right and what you see on the left is the history of just about every city in Europe. Um, the typical, pragmatic, reasonable 19th century expansion, uh, breaking the Baroque axis and beginning to take over the plain area that used to be the school of, uh, the equestrian school. And then uh, the contemporary current uh, uh, situation with the sort of uh, building of uh, housing units and the most sort of uh, sporadic and, and uh, clear uh, development uh, that still goes on. Also, like in most of these uh, cities in Europe, uh, there is a problem of uh, what has happened to the city. The historical city is still there. It is very attractive, but everybody's moving to the new part. The center of the town, the center of activities, it is a very poor town, um, is this area, can I walk? Um, <laughs> around there. So, there, those big white holes. <laughs> um, and uh, that is truly leftover that then was in a way transformed into little piazzas that they realize are very ugly and very bad and not really organized to offer any kind of, um, well, function the way they see it uh, functioning. And that's the area they wanted to intervene. Uh, you see now from one of the neighboring hills uh, that particular area. The main palazzo that you see there is the building that you see over there <laughs> with the um, uh, uh, blacker uh, walls. Um, you begin to notice a little bit more of a, a, a contemporary development uh, in which sort of different kind of building typologies begin to 
um, uh, mix. What we were asked really to reorganize these piazzas, and in fact there are three clear ones, the one at the very bottom, squarish, the one on the right that has that sort of uh, handle, uh, which is the largest one cut by, by the main street, and then the long one with the church at the top, more or less in the center, um, which were the three areas they want us to intervene. The characteristics are just uh, pretty much like this. That's the palazzo, the only building with presence in the area that could more or less sustain or support a public space. And the other one on the right, that picture should flip flop, but doesn't matter, uh, where the church is, and that's a sloping ground and then turns into the stair, um, which gives another kind of conditions. Uh, these are views of the piazza itself, and then from the piazza towards the palazzo and the church on the left. You can see how much this thing is trapped in this valley, uh, although this area is pretty flat. I mean, the, the presence of nature is, 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 is very much uh, there at all the time, and yet the, uh, the effect is always very urban, I would say. There is a small monument to the uh, dead on the war, on the First World War, in that piazza that's the only important commemorative element. And you see more or less the life now on that street which is the continuation, the broken sort of continuation. And here we have a rotation of axes, so uh, we have a problem of rotating grids. But anyway, um, the, uh, all the activity more or less here. That's the facade of that palazzo, the entrance, and establishes a very strong axis, well, the only thing of importance there that one can grab. And then a building typology that if you recall the plan, we're going to get back to the plan soon, uh, that is very, very uh, persistent, uh, mostly in terms of dimensions. Uh, it is uh, eight meters, and it's either two or three floor floors high. It has a shop in the, in the, at the bottom, and they just go one next to the other. They're like townhouses, or they could exist by themselves. The other condition to remember, that's the main street, is that we always have these kind of conditions with the mountains. And here, we have uh, the beginning of the project um, and the beginning of the drawings, if you want. Um, what I, I tell here is a story that is never as neat as it sounds because things never happen quite that way. But in order to explain how things finally fall, fell in some place, uh, one has to synthesize a lot of analytical process that went through. Uh, and some of them are very intuitive, some of them are just uh, simple uh, adjustments, if you want, to local conditions. Uh, that building type, 19th century building type that I was talking about, and the different kinds of conditions in which it appears. Uh, it seems to me that the two marks uh, that unquestionable where to generate any project here were the ones that have to do with the main street. The diagonal red line is the continuation of the main Baroque axis, if you recall, from the larger plan, because the city Baroque, the Baroque city ends at the breaking of that line. The other red horizontal one is the new street, the main street, but that continues. Uh, traffic goes now in only one direction, to the left, on that street, and there is only another street where one can go, which is the one at the bottom there. The rest are not usable for cars. Um, so those two lines uh, are, in a way, generators of all kinds of things. After that, an analysis takes us uh, into taking some other decisions, both to understand the conditions of the site, but then as generators of the design itself. Uh, dimensions uh, and proportions. Uh, uh, there is not so much of an issue of proportions here, but deciding on dimensions um, was, uh, was an issue, how to draw things on something that sort of moves uh, how to establish certain uh, parameters, dimensional parameters, 
Uh, since the Palazzo was the only building with, as I said, a certain presence cap capable of commanding somehow a public space, and since we did not have too much to intervene architecturally, with the exception of that building, the long one next to the Palazzo that was to be teared down, um, we took that dimension of the Palazzo to start generating what we do in this case, which is a literal square. <laughs> And by taking that square and that dimension into these other uh, piazza and establi starting to, to establish relationships. Once that's done, what before was a kind of shapeless space begins to appear as a long kind of uh, condition that and the plan, plan begins to have a certain intelligibility. Whereas on the square on the upper right, we maintain the axis as something to consider because of the palace uh, presence and symmetry and the condition of entrance of the palace and the location of the monument on access with that. On this case, as the entrance to the city, that street goes that way, this comes that way, is always through this corner. We rather mark uh, the diagonals that they seem to be uh, more uh, representing of the conditions of the site. And this strip becomes a strip of certain contention for a while. We didn't know what to do, but certainly it does uh, uh, establish at least a certain order and a center between uh, these two areas, which then coincide, as the monument is on that intersection, with the line that we trace uh, that has no too much explanation now, which is the perpendicular to the diagonal axis that cuts also through there. The other uh, analysis, as we mark some of these elements that uh, begin to organize the site, is that dimensional condition of this building uh, typology, that alternation between six meters of the streets and eight meters of the buildings, that begins to give us uh, a rhythm and to indicate other uh, possibilities of building intervention in this case. This, um, looking at these conditions, which should not, and that's now my point, be understood as a two-dimensional uh, game of um, graphics, but rather as lines that are concerned either with dimensions or with rhythms that exist, or with visual conditions, with lines of vision, visions that have to do with streets, with those kind of uh, uh, the perspectives of the streets, or with the conditions imposed for by, by frontality of certain buildings, and conditions of diagonality as one experiences entrances into the area. So uh, this is not a game, again, of composition of the plane, but rather a drawing through which we are seeing the actual conditions of the perception of the city. And from this we retain that kind of armature for the project on the right hand side of lines that become uh, generating lines for the project. The project, uh, well, this is upside down, but you can make the connections. Uh, the existing conditions here and the proposed uh, project. Uh, it is, in a way, very simple, and there is not uh, a total commitment to some of the suggestions here, except that uh, the square becomes a, a kind of, it has a kind of volumetric intimation of a cube, because that plane becomes totally horizontal, whereas the plaza now slopes towards uh, the bottom. Uh, the circular piazza is the one that takes on the job of dealing with the diagonals and uh, becomes also very three-dimensional as a kind of uh, market. The head of the market, the market, weekly market of Fridays happens now there on the two streets parallel to the main streets, and that is today the head of the market. So it's a fountain too. And as we do this, put these, uh, these uh, elements that are very primary, circles and the cube, um, we reveal a sort of a stratum of water. We bring back water to this part of town where it doesn't exist uh, as one of the elements that exist at the very origins of the city and which has maintained whatever claim to fame it might have. The idea uh, that water is, in a way, still its richest uh, resource. The long piazza serves as a connector between all these uh, um, 
uh, these two major uh, public areas and in that we just put most of uh, the trees we emphasize that particular exacerbate that length by putting you know a particular type of trees on that in that distance and we use uh, some figurative elements that like the two uh, statues of horses in very particular conditions to uh, pick up those visual lines that we had in our uh, armature of the project and to also refer in a way back to the origin of this whole area which was the equestrian uh, school. Some new buildings appear like the one on the right uh, which replaces the, this one here if you can flip flop that over there and on that piazza that is much, much more uh, difficult to use because of its slope, one proposes the standard thing that one does these days in Italy, which is an outdoor theater for some kind of summer music festival. Every city seems to have one. Uh, so they welcome that. And um, to that, all kinds of little new architectural elements appear. Here you see the model. Uh, and uh, the white represents all the interventions um, that we are proposing, and most of them are just interventions on the on the floor, really two-dimensional, like like the ones on the piazza of the theater, Piazza Santa Nunziata. Uh, the long piazza with the long Washington palm trees are uh, is the place to sit, and there is another row of trees under that for uh, the shade, which is not really represented in the model. Uh, the analysis of the building typology gives uh, us the opportunity to generate a diversity of urban elements to deal with uh, local conditions like the small uh, little square which only can contain a plan, the pavilions on the piazza which are very, very simple and they're just green, you know, with trees and four columns, the stage of the outdoor theater and the uh, head of the new building which is also the bus stop um, uh, of the town, uh, of the bus that goes to the town. On the iconographic side, uh, the forms that we chose tend to coincide in a way without really repeating them necessarily, uh, the ideas that uh, exist in the old town, the cube, the circle, the long perspectival space, and of course what I'm reserving for later, the tower and its relationship to um, the fountain. <coughs> One has, you have to understand that uh, this job we did with a kind of sense of frustration because as, as architects, what we would like to do would have been to work in the old part of the city. Uh, there are beautiful buildings there to restore and to bring new life to what I think is a very splendid urban fabric. And yet we had to work on d this with very little um, elements and knowing that by reinforcing the public areas on the new town, on the new part of town, the most uninteresting part of town, one probably is putting, you know, in the sort of kiss of death to the old uh, uh, center. So there is an attempt with the means we had at hand to, in fact, uh, uh, reestablish a certain tie with the old town itself and to regenerate its life from what we're intervening here, which is the main um, purpose in the end of the tower itself. I'm going now through all these other images, and these are the elevations before and after, but they're very hard to see, so I'm just going to move now to this little creature, uh, which is uh, the tower. Again, this should be the other way. Um, <clears throat> the tower that appears at that very a particular point of those perpendiculars to the diagonal that hit at the center of the intersection of the axis of the door of the palazzo uh, in the piazza. Um, so uh, is there then for a purpose? Uh, this is a tower, obviously. Uh, I hope you'll see it as a tower because it is the intention. This is a city that unlike most of the other Sicilian cities, that were colonized by the Arabs, this was not, this was founded after, long after the Arabs were left, has no tower. Uh, they either have Arab towers or, or Lombard towers. Uh, so the idea of a tower was not uh, uh, an oddity here. And uh, <clears throat> this tower appears, that, again, um, at that particular point, 
you have to reverse this. Is it possible to reverse this one? Do you think? Well, um, okay. <clears throat> Um, that point, then, the, the point of that right angle next to the church, the uppermost uh, point in the center, which is then the point of the continuation of the, um, yes, of the uh, Baroque axis. I'll be back. Um, the Baroque axis <clears throat> which uh, then has a very particular relationship to the new plaza. This is a tower and uh, as a tower it does what uh, towers uh, should do which is uh, what towers do uh, which is to bring you to a privileged position in order to see things in a different way that you would see them uh, from any other kind of building type. That's what towers were created and that's what we still like about tall buildings is that we go and see things differently from a vantage point. This tower uh, is not different except that like many other um, Sicilian things I would say it does it with a little bit of a, a, an excess. Um, <clears throat> it is a tower that as you uh, move up, next on the right. No, the other way. No, you're going back. You are going back. Okay, okay. Um, as you, yes, okay. Oh, <laughs> well, now it's. Um, <laughs> okay, as you go up, uh, there are optical instruments, some of them with um, actual. Uh, optical devices, some of them are just tubes, that focus on the urban and historical events of the town itself, sorry. Oh, this is disastrous. Okay, leave it there, leave it there, leave it there. Leave it there. Uh, as you um, go up then, you see um, different, uh, you frame some parts of the city that uh, have some significance. On the perspective on the left, you see in these little uh, uh, frames, like the ones in rifles, you know, um, for shooting, uh, some of those actual, as they were planned and they are calculated, some of the elements that are being framed by these, uh, these uh, telescopes, let's call them, uh, the two cities across the valley in Ancalashiveta, the Baroque axis, Umberto I, the cathedral, the piazza, the round piazza, the local current day municipality. But being located in that incredible spot that we found from where all these things can be seen, the tower can also be seen from every spot in the town. So from the axis, the Baroque axis, that's where the tower appears. Next on the right. No, please, we must go forward. That's it. 
uh, as we look from the tower to the cemetery and the church of the Spirito Santo on the top of the hill, this is the view from the cemetery towards the city with the tower there. Okay. As we look towards the convent of the Capuchins, the best, most beautiful church with a fantastic uh, uh, novelli painting uh, and, and very good uh, sort of also cemetery, and from the church towards uh, the tower. From the tower to Piazza Carella, that's it, uh, where the monument is still there of the, of the uh, dead in the war, one of the horses at the corner as it looks now directly to us in the tower, and there the view from the piazza, from the monument towards the tower itself. There you see the cube and the fountain. From the tower to center stage of the theater, from the stage to the tower and the church, from the tower to the door of the church itself, and as one leaves the church, uh, this is the tube that one sees. It's the only one that perforates the tower and goes through, so one should be able to see the sky as one leaves the church, which is very appropriate. Um, it is then an analogous building of the fountain in many ways, but it is not identical has very little to do with it. But it is a building which is clearly a building type. The fountain is a fountain, this is a tower, but which does many, many other things. Uh, it sort of exacerbates its own function. Does it in excess, like the fountain. This is not a fountain, it's 24 fountains in one fountain. This is a tower that lets you see things, but lets you see things much better than you would see if you just go and, and go to the top. Um, it is also an optical device, as the fountain is, in that it, in this case, it wants to put back together the whole uh, city as it is now fragmented, and it begins to play that role, as the, seat, as the fountain once upon a time used to put together the valley and its, um, <coughs> and its uh, uh, productive valley and the city into one thing by framing these views. Um, and to all of that, we had to do a lot of drawings. This is a drawing, unfortunately, that is not, it's almost impossible to photograph because of the detail, which is what I call the construction, the T-H-E, yeah? construction of the tower, <laughs> uh, not deconstruction. And um, it's, um, it's uh, all the geometrical construction, and uh, there are three scales in this drawing because the plan of the city is there and also the scale in larger, and then the transposition of all the axes, and the rotation of the, of the um, that you can see over there, of the tower in order to um, reflect, um, to, I mean, uh, construct scientifically uh, these devices that, uh, and, uh, Let's see a few more images, and then I can begin to wrap this up. And of course, the thing that interests a lot of people, and it's probably the only one that is not so fundamental, but it's more of a personal story than any kind of iconographic uh, attempt at, at uh, make something very strange. Um, but it is that, going back to the issue of dimensions, um, this tower had no dimension for a long time, and one day it was a little taller and another day was a little shorter. Um, and one day, by those coincidences, on the desk, a drawing of the fountain was, that was being drawn at, at a certain scale was close to, to the drawing of the tower. And I began to realize they were almost the same dimension and they indeed are. So I put one, uh, one trace over the other and it is as if they got sort of glued and uh, one became part of the other inseparable. So I decided to uh, engrave, as it were, on one of the walls the, uh, the, the fountain, the, prof the, the most important lines of the fountain, 
Uh, you must understand, although this is the one that probably has been published, uh, this side, it is the side that nobody sees, it's the one against the church, so uh, it is really like, like a secret that the tower has about its own origin, but it's not really uh, its most uh, public uh, uh, part. Uh, but that's how we got there uh, to establish this kind of uh, relationship, which in a way one should see as a very intimate relationship. One should not really disturb this relationship between the fountain and the tower, uh, in, which, in that both share, in a way, the same uh, purpose of putting this whole uh, artifact of the city uh, back together uh, in one thing, and uh, of being a monument, of being the most memorable, memorable thing of the city, of making the visit to the city memorable. Uh, and doing that, in a way, with uh, all the, uh, these are the views from the tower, with um, the instruments of uh, architecture. As one arrives to the top, I forgot to say, there is a little bit of water, but I'm sure that I'm going to drop this now. Uh, because, no, I'm not that fond of that. That becomes a little bit too literal a reference to the fountain. Um, but uh, the idea was that there was going to be a little bit of water. And as time passed, you know, it was filled to the rim. And uh, it will, you know, with a little bit of breeze, sometimes there are a lot of, you know, little, little earthquakes in Sicily. So it was going to spill over a little bit, this water. And, um, you, you would have a little bit of, of green sort of appearing at the top. So one would begin to actually see that there was water there too. Um, I'm not sure about that anymore, but I'm sure um, <laughs> about one thing. I'm going in two weeks uh, to discuss next stage of this job, so that's what I'm so excited about. Um, is that um, in doing this, I mean, if we can retrace a little bit what we were saying before, uh, all those... Um, instruments of architecture that I was saying, all those notions of space, and all the use of techniques of representation uh, were put uh, to, um, to use the, from the perspective we see them. Uh, I think uh, to call things now by their rightful names, again, uh, we deal with buildings as such for what they are and what they do. And uh, by doing that, I think we found other ways in where to put uh, architecture to work uh, artistically without dependence necessarily on any other kind of uh, medium or art form. This is, this is it. Thank you.